This is the webinar, Writing an Abstract for a Research or QI Poster Presentation. I'm Terry Peach, and I'm going to present this topic. This is a 30-minute webinar. The Association of Rehabilitation Nurses is accredited as a provider of nursing continuing professional development by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. Again, my name is Terry Peach and I'm your presenter today. I'm an associate professor and associate dean of the undergraduate nursing program at Newman University in Aston, Pennsylvania. I will not be discussing any off-label use and I have no industry relationships to disclose. We have three learning outcomes for today's webinar. First, describe the purpose of writing and submitting an abstract for a conference poster presentation. Second, discuss the major content headings of a research study or QI project abstract. Third, discuss the importance of knowing the conference abstract guidelines. For instance, what are the word limitations? How should I write this? Is there a specific format that I should use for the narrative and the reference? Let's move on to the webinar. So the first question to ask is, what is an abstract? What does that mean? And if you're unfamiliar with the term abstract, a good strategy might be to go take a peer reviewed journal that you are a, that you have as a subscription and look to see um, where abstracts are in the journal. Journals are one of the best places to see really good examples of an abstract. It's always good to use a template when you're working on something that you're not as familiar with. And so using a peer reviewed abstract to see the format could be very helpful to you. So an abstract, what is it? Well, it's really a short summary of your completed work. It describes your work without going into excessive detail. Abstracts are self-contained. They're considered to be standalone, meaning that you could read the abstract and understand what the authors are talking about. You'll get key points and summaries. So they are concise. They are concise. They have word limitations. If an abstract is done correctly, it will actually make the reader want to learn more about your work. You can think of an abstract as a way to express your the theses or your concept or your clinical problem. And then you fill in by providing key highlights or summaries about your clinical problem. Abstracts are limited. They won't be a whole page or two pages typed. And so the limitation will vary. It could be between 250 to upwards of 500 words. It will depend on the organization. The ARN conference currently is using a limit of 400 words, but they are breaking the 400 words down into four categories. So each category has a 100 word limit. There are a total of four categories, and that's how we get to the total of 400 words. I'm going to specifically talk about two ARN abstract categories, the Quality Improvement Project and the Research or Scientific Study. So now that we have an idea what an abstract is, let's talk about the purposes of an abstract. And there are four main purposes. The first is to pique the interest of your reviewers and readers to want more information. So you are creating your abstract initially for an acceptance into the conference, but then your abstract will be uh, distributed to the readers or to the participants of a conference. And it want, you want to design it in such a way that people read it and say, wow, this really, this really sounds very exciting or it's different or I understand this problem. I want to see exactly how they work through the clinical problem, the clinical issue, the educational issue. Second, it is to give reviewers and readers an accurate, concise, and brief summary of the major points of the content. Now I'm thinking, if you're getting ready to submit an abstract, you have hours and hours of work, either on a quality improvement project or on a research study. 
And you might be thinking, how do I possibly get this down to 250 or 300 words or 400 words or even 500 words if that's what the organization permits? It can be done. And the main concept is that you have to take the highlights of your study, those really important points, and present them to your audience. Now, we often think of the abstract as the doorway into the conference, but actually the abstract serves another purpose. It helps both reviewers and readers when they go to your poster presentation. So your abstract provides an initial uh, reading or initial uh, re reading of your content, of your project, of your study. And so your reviewers and readers, when they come to your poster presentation, they already have an idea of what you're going to be speaking about. And so when they get to your presentation, they'll be able to dive in deeper and have a greater understanding because they'll have had that initial information. And then the fourth purpose is to spread or to discuss your evidence. The, the term is often disseminate your evidence to both internal and external audiences. Think of your internal audiences as those within your organization and your external audiences as those who have not seen your project or your study before. So external audience would include the external reviewers that will decide whether or not your abstract will be accepted or rejected. And then others such as the participants of the conference or your external audience. So there's some things I think you should think about and know before you actually write your abstract for ARN. I really encourage you to create an account in ARN's portal for the conference. This is an excellent way to understand all the expectations that ARN has for you when you are submitting an abstract. So I've highlighted some of the more um, important concepts that align with the learning objectives. I've not hit everything that's in the portal, but given you the concepts that are really important when you're thinking about the actual abstract. There is a word limit for the submission. I've already mentioned to you that it's actually the submission for an abstract will be broken into four different sections. And within that four sections, each section will have a hundred word limit. So not only do you know the limit, you need to know the required sections of your abstract. And the best way to learn that is to go into the ARN portal. So for instance, if you're doing background and method, it would be a hundred word limit or results or findings. It would be a hundred word limit. The writing format, we all can remember that from being in school. Maybe some of us have published and there's always a required writing format. ARN suggests the APA format should be used and they don't specify the edition, but for those who maybe are unsure, the current is the seventh edition. Also, before you write your abstract, you should look in the portal at the ARN topics that best match or align with your work. So some examples of current topics that are in the portal would include the nursing process, psychology, medications. You'll want to do this ahead of time to make sure that you have a topic that's going to match ARN topics for the conference. I will say this though, over the years, I've always um, take, taken notice of the fact that the ARN topics are very um, broad. And so I'm thinking most likely you'll be able to match to a topic, but do ensure that that is in fact true so that you have written to the topic that you have chosen. Something we often don't think about, but usually projects, QI projects and research studies will have more than one author. So before you get started, have a discussion within your group everyone that is going to participate in the abstract because they participated in the project or the study and identify who is the primary or lead author. This is the person whose name will go first for the abstract submission and if you are accepted will go into publications. If there are more than one authors, 
also decide the order of the remaining authors. It will be up to the group, your group, to decide who's lead and how you're going to order the other remaining authors. But quite often the lead author or primary author is the individual that designed the study or the project and did a good percentage of the work. The order of the remaining authors may be based on the amount of work that was contributed, or it may be something as simple as an alphabetical um, sequence for the remaining authors. But please make sure that you do that ahead of time, because as you go to submit, one of the first things that you'll be asked to do is to uh, identify that lead author. And the lead author will become the person who will be the main contact person um, from ARN for the conference information. The ABCs. The ABCs should be used throughout your writing in the abstract. Accuracy, brevity, clarity. So when we talk about accuracy, what we really are talking about is your project or your study should mirror what you put in the abstract. What that really means is you would not be adding information into your abstract that was not part of your original study or your project. When you write from this massive project and massive study, you've got to get straight to the major points. And it should be the, the major highlighted points. Think about using consistency in your words. So when I did my dissertation work, I was studying nurses' attitudes toward e-mentoring. E-mentoring is often referred to as digital mentoring, internet mentoring, or i-mentoring. And I thought I would change up my words just because I got tired of writing e-mentoring. That's not a good strategy. It's much better to use consistency in your language so that there's no confusion for the reader. So you want to use clear and transparent language. So ABCs need to guide your writing of the abstract. Some additional thoughts for your writing. You don't write in bullets. You write with complete sentences. Think about jargon. So my example is, we often use the word nursing staff. So I'll ask you, what does nursing staff mean to you? And I could ask someone else in the audience, well, what does it mean to you? And then you could ask me. We might have three different definitions of nursing staff, or we could all have the same definition. What you want to do is be specific. If your population was registered nurses, use registered nurses. If your population was registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, certified nursing assistants, technicians, unit clerks, you could define nursing staff as all those categories and then use the word nursing staff. So this specificity is very important because remember your reviewers and your readers of your abstract don't know your project the way you do. You know your project, your study inside and out. We're just learning about it for the first time. So you have to explain to us what your meaning is behind these very important words such as nursing staff. Think about when you use past or present tense verbs in your abstract. So rule of thumb is that past, ten ver past tense verbs would be or could be literature review, your method or your approach, and your results and findings. The results and findings are going to be written out in narrative format or in sentences. Your present tense verbs are often your gap in knowledge. The gap in knowledge refers to what we didn't know about your problem, clinical problem. So when we read evidence, when we read the literature, we might read the history. For instance, I'll use my own dissertation work again. I read about the history of mentoring and how important mentoring is and traditional mentoring. But there was very little information about e-mentoring. So my gap in knowledge was e-mentoring. When I talked about traditional mentoring, I talked about it in the past tense because it was part of my literature review or my evidence. When I talked about e-mentoring, it was presented in current tense. Another present tense verb is implication to practice. Let's, let's get to the nuts and bolts of the poster abstract. 
formatting, the abstract format. And this is where looking at a peer reviewed journal that uses abstract could be very helpful because more than likely, more than likely they're going to have one of these two options. And usually the abstract is on the first page of the um, actual journal article. Let's talk about option one, paragraph format. You'll have a single paragraph, word limited. We'll use the word, we'll use the limitation of 250 words. You will start to the left. You will not indent at all. So all of the sentences will always be indented to the far left. No indentation of three or four tabs or one or two tabs. OK, the second option, which is called the structured format, you again will have a single paragraph, no indentation, but you might use labels to help break the sentences and to make it clearer to the reader. Now you're talking a background. Now you're talking about results and now you're talking about implications to practice. So the labels will be dependent upon um, how you are structuring your actual format. So these are just some examples of labels. Let's specifically now talk about the research headings and sections. So the first bullet says title and authors with their affiliations. You'll be asked to submit that, but it won't actually go into that narrative paragraph. The title and authors will be ahead of the actual paragraph. Think about the importance of the title. It should be something that catches the reader's interest. They really want to know more information about that. It's usually limited to about 10 words. The authors will also be above the actual abstract, and that's where that lead or primary author is so important because their name will go first with the other authors following. The affiliations will generally be separated out. Affiliations might be at the um, bottom of a page if it's being presented um, in an article, but on your poster, your affiliations might be somewhere toward the bottom of your actual poster. So although title and authors are not actually part of the formal abstract, they have to be included. Now let's move into actually that paragraph, that 400 or 250 or 400 or 500 word limit. We're going to have an introduction or background. That's that thesis, right? Why is this important? So in my case, my first sentence was a definition of e-mentoring because it was not well understood at that point in time that I was working on my dissertation. Whatever your important concept is, this is where you're going to give us that information and it's going to be limited to one or two sentences. Methods is the approach that you used and so in research you're going to identify the type of research that you use. Did you use quantitative descriptive? Was it a quantitative qual quasi-experimental? Was it qualitative ethnography study? Whatever your actual method that you used, you will make that statement in your abstract. That's important because someone reviewing a research study wants to understand the methodology that you used for your study. Throughout this, we're going to explain with accuracy, brevity, and clarity. clarity. So remember, accuracy is it has to mirror what you already have put into your study. Brevity is you need to be brief and to the point, and clarity is consistency, consistency of your terms. We're then going to move to your results. This is going to be narrative or it's going to be sentence format, so you're not going to be using charts and you will be specific. It is very good idea in the abstract to let us know the size, so your sample size by using accepted terminology such as n equals, um, so that we know your sample size. Conclusions, again, those major important conclusions and then your recommendations. What should happen now that your research is completed? So that is what will be actually in the abstract. And then just like we saw with title and authors, references and acknowledgements will be separated from that narrative. And references, I would suggest APA, and acknowledgements, you may need, don't have any acknowledgements, but if you do, you would include the acknowledgements separate from the abstract. Accuracy, brevity, and clarity. 
I didn't say this, but I just want to make a point. Generally, abstracts do not have citations in it. It's general information. However, at times you might have something that you feel you absolutely have to cite, and then you're going to have to make a decision how important that information is. Can it be excluded from the actual abstract and be added into the actual poster? Or in this case, are you going to have to make an exception and use a citation? But in general, you do not see citations in abstracts. So having looked at the research component, let's talk about quality improvement. It's going to look very similar with some slight changes. Title and authors, same idea. Very important, but they're going to be separate from the narrative. Now we have problem and aims. So problem, what was the issue? And then <clears throat> the aim. Um, and so when we talk about aim, we talk about aim as a clear and concise summary of what the quality improvement team planned or plans to achieve over a time period, including how much change or the magnitude of the change you will achieve. That aim guides your work or guided your work by establishing what success looked like. And then you're specifically going to talk about your QI model or your approach to um, your approach to your project. And so you want to be clear about that. So let's say you were going to use a model for improvement of plan, do, study, act. Plan, do, study, act. And you were looking at what are we trying to accomplish? How will we know that a change is improvement? And what change can we make that will result in improvement using plan, do, study, act? So you would, in an abstract, spell out plan, do study act, and then you could follow with the acronym PDSA. And then going forward in the abstract, you would use PDSA because that will save some of those word limitations that you have. You also will speak specifically as to what was your intervention? Was it that you put in a new assessment tool? Was it that you used new equipment? Was it that you changed a process with how patients are going to be admitted to the unit and then um, cared for on the unit and then discharged? So it's the intervention and change, and then you are also going to use narrative to talk about the results. So in both the research study and in the QI project, the abstract will not include charts. You will, of course, use charts most likely, in the actual poster presentation. And then finally, you're going to address standardization of change. So we know QI, and pro QI projects have resources. We know that we spend time and energy to make the change. But standardization of change speaks to how we'll have enduring change. It'll be lasting change. And so creating standard work includes, includes looking at sequence, timing, supplies, people, space, and equipment that are used for the project. And just like we saw with the research study, we're going to explain with accuracy. We're not going to add additional information in. Brevity, we're going to be brief, brief and clarity. We're going to be consistent with our terms. And then references and acknowledgments, just like we saw with the um, research section. So we're good to go, right? Well, not quite. We have to read it. Should we just read it? Should just your team read it? The best practice will be allow others to read before you submit. You and your team know your project, your study inside and out. And so you're going to accept potential errors much more easily, easier than an outside reader. And you're going to think that you have really have reached clarity. You don't exchange different terms. It's perfectly clear. And then you're going to allow someone else to read it and they're going to say, I don't quite know what you mean here. So read before submit not only talks about you reading, but allowing others. So ask for others to read before you submit. Choose your readers very um, deliberately. Think about professionals and think about non-professionals to read. Ask for them, for your readers, to check for your spelling grammatical errors, 
consistency of terms, and anything else that you think is important. Have someone else check that you didn't exceed the word limit. Now, just like you are going to do to prepare your abstract or to prepare when you were preparing your study or when you were gathering um, your evidence for your project, you went to the literature and so did I. I found something I want to recommend to you. It was in the literature, specifically Weldon Carson and Waitham in 2020 um, published this, their work on an internal abstract review committee, an IARC. I'm going to suggest you form an IARC at your work. We are a group of professionals that like to share our work. And I would strongly suggest that at your institution, you're going to find individuals who would be honored to participate on an IARC. So seek out individuals with the education or the experience in preparing and presenting at conferences. Ask if they would be willing to review submissions for conferences, or even submissions for publication. This internal abstract review committee will most likely provide an excellent resource for someone new that has never done abstracts before, never published before, never attempted to um, submit to, an app, to a conference, and for those that are seasoned, because we all need individuals to review our work. It's very hard to see our own work and identify areas that, oh, we missed it, we made an error, oh, there's too much space. Now, I'm thinking your organization may very much be in favor of this. So here's what you will need to do once it's up and running. You need to plan and leave time to use the actual internal abstract review committee. The committee members will be more than willing to do the work, but they'll want the time to do the work. And so you must leave time to use the I IARC. You can't be thinking about this on, on Wednesday night and expect that the committee members will turn it back to you on Friday. When you do make the decision to leave the time, Think about what you're going to submit. Submitting the abstract is a wonderful idea, but it would be even more powerful if you could submit the guidelines to the internal review committee so they could look and check and verify that you've actually met the guidelines that have been asked of you for your ARN submission or any organization submission. Allow time for the committee members to give you feedback. It's perfectly okay to ask the question about how long do you think it will be before I receive feedback and ask for the feedback to be written if possible. Once you get the feedback, read it carefully. If you don't understand something, ask for clarification. At this point, the committee members have invested in your work and so they'll be willing to share if you don't understand something or if you're questioning something that they commented on. So ask if you're unsure. So in summary, we're talking about high quality poster abstracts for submission. Here are four key summary points. The poster abstract should stand alone, meaning an individual should be able to pick up that narrative, read it and understand what your key points are. How that will happen is because you've interconnected the abstract parts. I started to talk about the background issue of e-mentoring. I then moved to my gap in knowledge, right? And then moved sequentially down to where I got to my recommendations about e-mentoring. Each of my sections of my abstract addressed e-mentoring. Peak the interest of your reviewers and readers. The if an abstract is done correctly, correctly, it makes the reader and the reviewers want to know more. You can do that. You create the interest by having a well-written, well-written, well-thought-out abstract. The abstract that is of high quality 
will encourage not only the re reviewers, but the conference attendees to want to read and discuss your poster with you because your abstract was of so much interest. They want to know more. And yes, they'll come and read your poster, but they're going to want to engage with you. That's what makes a high quality poster abstract. I presented to you my references from this presentation. Here is the specific re reference to establishing an internal abstract review committee published in nursing management in December of 22 by Weldon Carson and Wathan. I also have given you the DOI, the digital object identifier, so that you could go and at least read the abstract um, by um, using that DOI. Now I'm hoping that I answered your questions and didn't create more questions for you, but sometimes that happens. And so if I've left you with questions and you're unsure, I am certainly available to you. So I have given you my work email address that you can use. I would ask that um, on the header of your email that you put in ARN, ARN webinar, so I'll be more attentive and be try my best to answer them in a very timely manner. If you don't receive a response from me within 48 hours, please email me back. I'm sure I'm like all of you. I receive many, many emails in a day, and so sometimes I do miss them. And so I certainly would want to respond to any questions that you have. I want to thank you for listening to my webinar. I really have enjoyed discussing the art of an abstract, and I hope I have given you some information to think about. Thank you.